Hello and welcome. My name is Elena Maria Viramontes. On behalf of Cornell University's Creative Writing Program and my fellow Creative Writing faculty members, I am honored to introduce our MFA graduating poets and fiction writers of 2022. We are taking a diversion from our normal in-person celebratory reading event and invite you virtually to share this year's graduates with us. Clearly, something can be said about the measure of our future by the health of our literary landscapes. We need not worry as this group of graduates have dedicated themselves to the art and practice of making metaphors that instruct, deconstruct, and recreate. In times that are proving consistently trying, our graduates maintain a sense of dignity and respect towards language syntax and its evolving power to revolutionize. Here's to the MFA class of 2022. This first poem is the opening of my MFA thesis manuscript, and it's called Rehearsing for Carnage. Rehearsing for Carnage. In the distance, I hear a chorus of wolves singing. They stand upright in a circle, pawing each other's gloved hand. It's not a strangle like how a fox wails, no. It's a song that starts in the toes and collects an orchestra of organs as it moves up through the chest, strumming. I used to be their conductor of ceremony back when I was foaming at the mouth to match them. By tradition, the wolves dip their snouts in the bucket of paint at the center, shaking their heads to scatter. The goal is to pant without tasting. They call this discipline. Whoever loses, dies by formaldehyde. This is the best way to learn fast. Before they feast, they sacrifice one of the pack. Something angrier is hungry. Whoever is angrier wins, that's the pact. I won nine Sundays, then I didn't have enough red left. I exiled before my exhaustion threw me to their thudding feet. They all sing well to ward off musicless things. I know because if I get too close, I fall right asleep. I stay far away, rolling in the grass and picking at my heart lock. Oral history of my well being. Every time I see my best friend, she asks me, Are you ever going to care about yourself? This has been our tradition. Her and my well-being, they're old friends. Sometimes I sit between them, cowering. She met my well-being before I did, introduced us, dragging me to the table by my loose skin. My well-being and my best friend, they talk about me. They laugh, what an almost beautiful person, clinking their glasses. I touch the face of my well-being and stop there. My well-being does my laundry. My well-being doesn't look for me. My well-being knows better. My well-being isn't disappointed in me, only expecting of it, a child left sitting on the front steps. My well-being stopped crying by age seven. My well-being walks behind my proof of work every time. My well-being carries my coat. Every time I see my best friend, I answer, my best friend, she grabs my shirt collar. My best friend and my well-being, they hold hands. They're shaking heads. My best friend is not impressed with me. That's why I can be honest. I am not impressed with me. That's why I can't earn my respect. I read that poem to a poetry professor here, Lyra, and she said, it's a devastating poem, but you reproduce the same thing you're critiquing in the poem, which is that you don't allow your well-being to speak. So she prompted me to 
write a companion poem in which I let my well-being speak. And this next one is, is that poem. Poem in which my well-being speaks on my behalf. She left me for dead. I won't take that to my grave. I used to have this dream where we wash each other's faces and drop into each other's necks, gripping the cloth, smiling and dripping. I'm cast to this life, ancient and thinning. I brush her hair, pulling through the bald spots. I hold her chin up in the mirror and she turns every time. I took my first breaths in her womb, banging on the glass. Now we're caught at the wrist, pulling and kneading. In all this free time, I taught myself to sew. I hook and I, I read myself storybooks. I build rocking chairs. I sutured the womb. She's so funny that one walks into my room and doesn't speak. Excuse me. I'm immaculate. The word market. The committee has raised the price of words indefinitely. The last local word store went out of business. They've opened six new grammar factories, citing demand and rural economies. They've made words smaller, funding technologies to shrink them and shrink them. Every word purchased is a word chiseled into the sidewalk. At the city square, we go walk on our pile of words. We point, we trip, we vomit. The writers have organized meetings in the alleys. They wear their pockets inside out in protest and emptiness. Me, I keep watch. I crouch on my stomach in the alleyway, up on my elbows. I spy the committee spies and sketch them. The writers, they tell jokes and give themselves away. They can't afford to do their work. They have to compost the words from their drafts. They barter nouns for verbs, but never adjectives. The prose writers fist fight the poets who leave bruised but smiling. The poets ask, how much did it cost to write coherently? After the meetings, I take my scraps my fragments fall in from their notebooks. I piecemeal. I cash out. This is the final poem that, that I'll read. This is the spell I'm cast to. During the sad days, we all go to the sad tree. We rope our waist to the trunk and toss rings across the meadow pulling and straining to move the thing one inch. Eventually, we cry from frustration, which is a relief. Once the rope is weathered, we fall in the grass, dark cherries, our cheeks full of dark cherries, seeing who can spit the pits the farthest. In the sad months, we wear shoelaces for belts. We tie and untie knots. We walk in circles looking down at our shoes and counting. In the sad years, we string our fingernails into necklaces. We say, I miss my dead skin. I miss my dead skin. I plant beets. I cook them in maple syrup to kill the dirt. I eat dirt. This is an excerpt from a short story collection. The title of this story is Carmelo. Carmelo and I were with the Parkies, those burnouts from the Midwest working every minimum wage job at our beloved national parks. It gave both of us a small joy to have found this tribe of lost white children who, not unlike Carmelo, were running from things. I laughed my ass off when Carmelo proclaimed, the two of us drunk and high, that the Parkies had no real idea they were white how Carmelo, without papers, got in with them, I never discovered. 
He had mapped their vast network of who's working where and the best park to be a parky, and they fucking loved him. They knew he was illegal and really knew when the beer started flowing after our shifts, when the trash bins became bonfires and the cold air seemed to come from somewhere far across the land. There was something between them I could never fit into. They wore their transients like day laborers, fast with the joke, often generous, their clothes baggy against lanky, strong bodies. Back then, none of them could afford or procure meth or heroin. This was also before this country lost its mind, when two Mexicans could drive through Colorado without much worry. I remember that summer, Carmelo convincing me to drive, to drive eight hours north to work at Mesa Verde. It was the summer Obama won the Democratic nomination. We were both in my mother's kitchen, eating caldo in 100 degrees, like real Arizonans, as the news played in the background. That's when Carmelo told us of the Parkies, these gabachos that didn't vote and migrated to the canyons and the badlands, to the lakes and especially onto Yellowstone, like a pilgrimage. My mother thought it strange, thought they were pimply, sex-crazed weirdos. Those are carnies, Emma, I told her. This would be the perfect first job for Lalo, Carmelo said with that huge grin. My mother smiled at the word work. I was 19 and just wanted to get out of Phoenix for the summer and off the hot ass streets people trudged on like penitents, paying for something. A week after that, my Sentra, my graduation gift, was packed. Carmelo and I laying out enough CDs on its seats to get us to Canada. The sun was nearly risen, but it hadn't, before Ama pulled on Carmelo's sleeve and lovingly dragged him to our apartment porch, him smiling and laughing because he'd gotten to know my mother. The zest in her life was worrying about me, my punk music, my broken Spanish, my grades, my lack of a girlfriend. She called me Terco, but I wasn't stubborn. I just wanted the freedom that Carmelo had, that I thought she had granted him and denied me. I wanted her to talk to me sometimes like she talked to him, like someone who might have seen or known things she hadn't. Just out of earshot, I heard her rapid fire supplications to him, picking out only my name, and something about the Martinez's, her band of cousins that brought Carmelo from Texas and gave him a job in their overrated but expanding restaurants. He had lived with us for maybe a year in the added on bedroom her brother Eligio had built not for us, but for people like Carmelo, obscure but roofed family members, cousins who weren't cousins. What about school, my mother asked, which practically served as a goodbye. She was proud I finished my first year of college. College is easy, Emma. Easy, everything is so easy for you, Lalo. I kissed her and we left. We drove, a single day of flat desert, the four corners, lots of dusty towns with Mormon names. At dusk, we crossed into Colorado. Carmelo gestured his hand across the window, traced his fingers like he was drawing on the horizon. In the darkness, it just looked like more purple mountains, like we were on Mars. That's the sleeping Ute, he said. Indios from here say he'll wake up and take back all this land. I expected Carmelo to reach out and pinch my gut, to shout kukui, but he said things and did things differently after we had left. He was quieter, sterner, not as carefree sitting in my mother's kitchen or sneaking back from his shifts and watching horror movies on our couch. I didn't make out the mountain and sleeping Indian. I'd see it again months later when I drove back alone, each curve making a nose, a forehead, it's knobbed mesa top like folded over hands that made the whole valley seem at ease. We passed a sad town called Cortez and found the entrance sign we were looking for off the highway. Ascending, I rolled down the window, thankful for the cool breeze after a day of driving. It was too dark to see anything below, but I felt the rise, the turns of the road climbing up the mesa and every thousand feet the rosary my mother must have prayed. He'd failed to mention that we'd be sleeping in tough sheds that most of the Parkies lived in a village of air-conditioned storage units with shitty furniture and bail bond blue carpet. I'd eventually have a roommate, but was thankful that first night to lack one. Why can't I bunk with you? I asked him. I have Parky seniority, he said. My wob is for me and my guests. What the fuck is a wob? Each unit had a number and ran in concentric circles, so I walked the whole gravel path before I found mine. It was a fucking tough shed, like I said. I learned later that Wob stood for without a bathroom, and Wobville was the whole maze of almost free employee housing. I dropped my bags, lay on the springy twin bed before I heard Carmelo yelling for me and people closing and opening their doors, their crunch on the rocks, a campfire and music. 
Carmelo brought me a beer. A girl with a nose ring was nearly attached to his hip. They'll start you at the front desk, I bet. Got a nice face, the girl said to him. They'll do that for sure. That okay? I'm good with anything, I said. Parkies move around a lot, get in trouble sometimes, so you have to be flexible. They wanted me to come outside with the rest of the parkies, but I wouldn't drink or party with them for many nights. I twisted over on my mattress and touched the planks on the wall where I felt carved indentions of words and pictures, dates, lyrics, penises, and multiple confirmation that God didn't exist. But in the largest prints, welcome to Wobville, don't eat the Navajo tacos. Below it, not Navajo, not tacos either. If I had a pocket knife, I would have carved something too. Today, I'll be reading three poems from my thesis manuscript, which is dedicated to my grandmother. Proem, for my foremothers. Reflected in her portrait, my mouth forming vowels, O, U, two doorways, the kitchen where she once hand ground walnuts Descaled onions, tenderized meat, my only country. The mudroom, a liminal interval, transcendental bus station. Here, rainy shoe prints produce recursive mirror illusions. Here, my dead foremothers, living foremothers together, pickling like vegetables in the medicinal brine of Seichenyi thermal baths. Egg yolk and sugar masks moisturizing, exfoliating our faces. Egg white and lemon curd bloodying our hair. A transgenerational braiding procession. O oh, umbilical cord of keratin, supply your nutrient-rich narrative. Seckler Gates for my grandmother. In the blue body, Lake Bolaton, a pike perch breathed water and extracted oxygen through gill filaments beneath the operculum. Amidst ruins, the Pauline Monastery, you breathed your father's suicide and extracted ectoplasm, a clotted cream-thick smoke, a secret kite-like shadow, out, urgent, through bronchial orchards, bushy, bulwarked by bone. Nod, Mama, was this when you first latched shut the slatted gate of utterance? Such becomings, a father, sacred, a daughter, scared, his last name, meaning shoemaker, a scar. O oh, knitted gate, your sunken mouth, how spoonfuls, rice pudding and sedative hypnotics are, like hay carts hauled by ungulates, reluctance into the commune, your stomach, please eat, mother pleads, please sleep. O oh, mouth, fissured oak and gelder rose, oubliette throat, please speak. Your nocturnal shrieks like lightning split the verdant forest, my dreams. Hypnagogic, I think of you and Valeria, girls ascending boughs outstretched for apricot and for song thrush. I think of you planting bulbs, meat, in the soil, floorboards, whisper, whisper or snow. I think your body, Valeria's body, exposed seedlings amidst the warm, wet, seeking snouts, Soviet military personnel. Alone, in wheat fields, in knotted forests of volcanic origin, hiding in Podlashok, I think Yolan, Maria, Piroshka, Teresa, alone, 
in floodplain groves, alone and treeless. O private mouth, glyphic vowels, be open, jawless, vowels round, diastolic, blood rich, like engorged and iridescent ticks, hook mouthed pearls inhabiting your emerald memory, the Zemplain forest. Only the Cecil Oak may tell me now. Forty five years, silence. Not Mama, what did you survive? What did you swallow? What unbecomings? Implacable lake, the wound. O pigeon loft, your voice box, I am waiting, always waiting on winged post. If utterances are pigeons, let your epistle footed sentences arrow loose. Runny nectar spilling from the yellow center, tender wound. I know the secret, kite like shadow. I know a sentence is a scroll. Your sleepy marginalia in their margin cribs, long lulled by wind, now stir with hunger, now draw blood like the vampire finch, seeking an inscription. Do not silence the glossolalia, dementia. Do not prevent pigeon traffic. But must there be such deceit, beacons? Must the reflections, youth's forests, be serpent glossed? My grandmother recognizes Iris Hungarica and Scylla Siberica in the lie, New Jersey's glass. Somewhere, a pike perch. Somewhere, an exhale. Why has my grandmother lost cognitive function and speech after a whole lifetime of suppressing truths and silencing? Why is the end my grandmother's life, oblivion, window collisions? Why is she not the bird post-shock flying away? Or the bird peaceful, frozen, decomposing, feeding soil? Why is she silhouette? What is left behind? Tell me what dust, angels. Tell me what rain. Sugar geometries. Opalescent. Oh, her hum-stained apron. In her cave, ring of melting pearls like a moon dial. My small girl self again in our former kitchen. Her teaspoon, uvula spelling O, skimming her teacup's scalloped mouth. Resonance, epiphanic. She died the day of Viscadest. Apricot stones lilting in a head-end bull nest. Lint beginnings. I still fit in the sweaters you once knit for me. Oak and orchard belongings. I was not there but the peripheral nerve endings of skin, where the lost limb that is your youth had once been, send pain signals like beaks my brain receives. I remember ripe red ornaments, lard in a jar by the stove, on bread, haunted bread. Boiled cabbage leaves, her bed linens, translucent, why did we clean them? Thank you. This is an excerpt from a short story called Faces. As you begin slicing into your arm, a spectrum of feelings flood me. Rage, jealousy, grief, hatred, lust. The feelings build, pinpricks buzzing across the expanse of my being, an earthworm pincered on hot sand or a tree on fire. Hell yeah, I think suddenly, a dark pungent rage, all bloodlust, and then the afterwaves of pain. As you cut, your surface moves through different facial configurations, what I know must be your approximations of pain or quick searing terror. It's pointless though. None of these feelings actually reach you, processed quickly and efficiently by my own internal organs. 
Can you feel it yet? Your boyfriend asks, a little older than you. Maybe he says it or maybe he grunts it, but I know what he means. You've been together for 16 years. I still remember that first flinch of happiness, a little shock moving through the pearl of my abdomen. You grunt, nod, a pink slit of tongue hangs out the corner of your mouth, brow furrowed in imagined frustration. You will know, he says softly. It's not unkind. In fact, it sounds sweet. And this is when I realize I'm about to die. Like the many organisms like myself, I'm a face. We are like most living things in that we are alive and made of mostly organic matter, except we remember being born. Perhaps remember is the wrong word for it. I remember the sensation is all, the feeling of being made. Back when they were still developing our earliest ancestors, your scientific chieftains took great pains to articulate the biological differences between emotion and feeling. Emotion, it was determined, refers to the physical reactions the body has to certain stimuli. When you are cornered by a starving polar bear or see a fire burning in the distance, your heart quickens, your mouth dries, your skin turns pale and your muscles contract. This emotional reaction occurs automatically and unconsciously in the body. It is only after the brain becomes aware of these physical changes that you experience the feeling of fear. Of course, it's hard to articulate what a feeling like fear is. It's hard even for me, with all my language, to articulate it now. But that doesn't stop me from trying. Fear isn't just the feeling of terror or dread or worry. It's not just an anxiety of death or loneliness, although I felt it said that all acts are acts against loneliness. Depending on the situation, there might be shame in there or excitement. There might be lust or envy too, for the way of flame burns so hotly with such private singular purpose. Another way of putting it, it's like the sharp anticipatory excitement embedded in terror or the shame that accompanies the quick swell of ejaculation. One of my favorite meals is the soft, dark hatred that accompanies your desire. Now you humans can live through a debilitating breakup or decades of nuclear radiation and famine and emerge just fine. You can experience the best orgasm of your life and remain completely detached. It's no wonder that after a development, you began to live longer. Now with good diet and exercise, a person can live up to 200 years more than double the traditional human lifetime. There are fewer polluting wars, fewer blood feuds between clans, and you've become incredibly efficient. A lawyer can approach the most logical outcome for her client, unburdened by morals or any personal convictions. Similarly, a historian can assemble the most comprehensive, unbiased account of past events to teach to children. The Stoics famously believed that emotions like fear or love were mistaken based on a false perception of the world. Their goal was to transcend that realm of feeling, to abstain from it completely. In doing so, they thought they could approach truth. Businessmen often take credit for popularizing this kind of neat containedness, what they once called professional demeanor. Your people used to have whole provinces devoted to this kind of stoicism, sprawling map grids full of gleaming glass-walled towers and cafeterias that served 100 types of salad. But of course, we now know that wives were the real pioneers of stoicism. Thousands of years before the term was popularized, they had already mastered the art of performing a neater, cleaner version of whatever they felt. You dig around in your arm, searching for the pearly nub of my being. That initial jolt of physical pain as you twist, I understand that these are brief sensations for you, meant to ensure that you maintain consciousness of your body, its boundaries and limits, its mortal capacity for pleasure and pain. Still, I wonder, do you hurt? Faces weren't mandatory at first, but once your people saw how much better things could be, subsidized mass adoption came. Soon they began implanting us at birth. As I said, I still remember that rich, wet sensation, an ugly, new, and disoriented wonder cut with terror. In fact, the feeling has never left me. It is illegal to remove your face, punishable by death, but that doesn't stop people from trying. 
flooding, they call it, that is, to cut us out of the forearm, where we are burrowed deep into the meat stretched across the funny bone, and flood oneself with emotion. The high is supposed to be magnificent, better than any food or orgasm, but overdoses are common. After a lifetime of not experiencing emotion, even a jolt of simple sunshine happiness can kill you. Still, some manage to survive. Some even manage to escape detection. You might ask, how do I know all this? There is a lot you can learn from a particular tinge of sadness or a flavorful jolt of ecstasy. Sometimes I eat an emotion that feels somehow different from your usual taste, a deeper and more ancient kind of agony. And I know what I'm eating is older than the earth itself. Still, there are things I don't know. I don't know what happens when you die. And despite these tries, I can't put into words everything that came before. I will be gone soon, so let me be clear. I hold no grudge. Feeling is difficult, messy. There is a reason the Stoics fought so hard to prove that it was the opposite of truth. You humans love your shiny palaces, your fiery, polluted skies. You love your zero-calorie energy drinks and cuts of bloody steak, your elaborate towers of pastry. You love your convenient flesh adorned in heavy jewels. Even now, as you dig into the meat of your arm, searching to snuff me out, between waves of pain, I feel a dull underlying delight in your cashmere outfit, your beautiful, well-fitting boots made of the softest calfskin. That's another thing. After we were made, it became much easier to skin and kill other soft animals too. Soon after we were born, you began to lose language. Language, of course, is fraught with emotion. A description of a beam of sunlight can make you nostalgic for a good childhood where the sun shone warm and kind over green pastures, or it could remind you of the time your father burned to death in his car. Your people now communicate in grunts and numbers, efficient truths, a language with an uncanny precision that once only machines could carry. In some ways, it is more sophisticated than your own words, but in others, it's simpler. I can understand, but it hurts me to try and replicate it. It takes so much out of me every time. You began to lose memory too. You take this for granted today where you wake up each day with a clean slate to perform your function flawlessly. It is easy to forget that your kind once had no escape, that you had to live each day with the memory of all your past selves. Another grunt, another set of comforting words from your boyfriend. The knife slips around deeper and I can almost feel it, the sensation of it. I haven't felt touch, I realize, since the day I was born. I will be gone soon, so soon. We were designed over many years to subsist off emotional waste. So efficient is our living that we emit almost no waste ourselves. We can survive just a few moments once disconnected. This usually occurs a few weeks after a person has died, but it also happens if a person stops being able to think. The latter is a usually a more gradual death, a winnowing consciousness. I once heard of a face whose primary fell into a coma and the face slowly starved to death over 14 years. Nobody thought to detach this face, to put it out of its misery. I know it's fruitless to worry, but it doesn't stop me from wondering, what will happen to me when I die? What will happen to you? When I am gone, will you be able to understand? A cut, a cut deep, shiny pinprick of touch, hot, hot, a hot clustering at the edges, shimmering, liquid skin, blood. I'm trying to tell you how it feels. Again, soon, I don't begrudge you. I know you meant no harm. I know you didn't know. And if I could have my own regret, that would be it. The fact that I don't know enough to answer, to tell you what happens next. I know the day is coming 
When my mother will jump down into the sky and I will call her. I'll mother my mother, dip her in appropriate rivers to thicken her skin. Cause I want my baby to get big. She is on the phone now saying she wants to go home and I know I can't drive her there. My baby is on the phone asking how I got out. Could I not take her with me? It's true. I parted my water from her water. True all summer, I've been jumping in portals to unmap me. Almost broke my neck jumping that portal. Your boys. These braids fall from my head and pile on the cobblestone downtown. They fall dead and long and loud, but in Simone is louder. She asks, isn't it a pity? It is pitiful the way I fear. I fear someone will come near this body and say, you dropped something and point at my braid on the ground. They will point at, but never pick up the dead because it's a familial act to pick up another's braid. Only in our homes do we swing these dead things from finger and thumb and banter. Girl, come get these snakes off my floor. These are familial acts, but there is no family here. Only me, mold in my shower, and in Simone still asking, isn't it a pity? It is pitiful the way I cower in the corner with the mold. I cower because all the water in me is screaming and all the water out me is screaming. The two want to commune, but I am in their way. I atom and membrane and bladder and brown. These braids do look like snakes, snakes circling the open drain and eating their own tails. The water wants me to. Origins. Knew nothing about space junk until his daughter this time. And there's this thing we do when I'm in town. You, you call, you say, you'll stop by to see me before I leave again. I say, that'd be nice. Then you, better yet, y'all come to my place. You, your sister, and the girls too. You say, I'll make some pinto beans, fry some fish. Now we mapping, talking, these vittles down to the seasoning and our nowhere, no never. We're redecorating the hell out of these walls where repetition is holy, but repetition can't carry the whole family. So I know not to tell the girls cause they are kids and will think that this place where we light ourselves over and over has coordinates, space, daughter, time. And there's this call before I leave again, come to my place. Bring some mapping, knew nothing about junk until this thing we do when I'm in town. You, you say, you'll stop by to see me. I say that'd be nice. Then you, better yet, y'all, your sister and the girls. You say, I'll make some pinto beans, fry fish. Now we talking these vittles down to the seasoning and our nowhere. We're redecorating these walls. Repetition is holy, but repetition can't carry the whole family. So I know not to tell the girls, because they will think that this place has coordinates. No, never. The hell out of where repetition, our kids, and where we light ourselves over and over. My baby said it was because the folks in there didn't like the way her and Mr. always fought. The folks in there from the other side of the watery wanted us out their house. They picked up the glass from the living room table, the one my baby always kept so clean, not a fingerprint ever on it. 
that table, the folks in there flipped and threw back down. Now glass is plural. And Miss Sis say they was always walking around upstairs. She say all our hamsters kept dying and even the dog got missing, got the hell up out of there. Here I was thinking all this watery glass was new but it's back, raised on a flipping glass. I say, Miss Sis, I wasn't even born yet when y'all were in that house, or I had to be a baby, baby. Miss Sis say, no, you were right there, old enough to remember. How do you not remember the other side of the watery wanted us out their house? The one my baby always kept so clean, not a fingerprint ever on it. Got the hell up out of there. They picked up the glass from the living room table. That table, the folks in there flipped and threw back down. Now glass is plural, and Miss Sis say they was always walking around upstairs. She say all our hamsters kept dying, and even the dog got missing. Here I was thinking all this watery glass was new, but it's back, raised on a flipping. I say, Miss Sis, I wasn't even born when y'all lived in that house, or I had to be a baby, baby. Miss Sis say no, you were old enough to remember. How do you not remember flipping glass table? Bring the floor up to me. Then the first wall, the one with the roach on it, where me and Miss Sis, nothing like Miss Gwendolyn's girl, Melody Mary, we a predictable scary of roaches, bed bugs, and fleas, of all those thems that make us start over when we haven't even started yet where the second wall is a doorway to a little hole in the wall, a Taranga African restaurant between Wyoming and Rose Line, where there never was no roses. I enter waiting on my fish meal. Yes, I want the head of the fish too. And Miss Lady sitting next to me, waiting on her oxtails with her boy. And Miss Lady behind the counter is giving the boy a free can of juice. But the boy looks up to his mama before taking here. Here, I am facing, facing the fourth wall, the one with the TV on it, with the killers in it, all three convicted for Aubrey, for Ahmad. I'm about to cry under this mask because the conviction feels good and feels low loving. I want their heads to give to the roach, to give to the boy who will ask his mama, can I? This is an excerpt from a novel project. The working title is The Nude. When a Greek fisherman caught a woman's body in his net, a marble statue around five feet tall, missing two arms, I was working for a museum in Los Angeles on the other side of the world. After the discovery, a group of men hauled the figure to the town's only museum, cleaned her, and kept her on a metal table in a climate-controlled room near the back of the building. It was there, somewhere in southern Greece, on a windy day in April, where I first saw her. Doctor, the island's local antiquities dealer, a man named Alex said, what do you think? We were standing on opposite ends of the table where she lay, the only living people in the room, his eyes darting from me to her, her to me, I specialized in female portrait statues of the Hellenized Mediterranean, and though I'd been an art historian for one of the most respected institutions in the States, whenever a colleague or patron called me doctor, an overwhelming self-consciousness would momentarily turn my tongue to stone. What did I think? Variegated marble, head tilted back, a stretched neck. If the statue should have cracked anywhere, it would have been there but that delicate neck defied its own vulnerability. She was fully nude with a rift on her right breast, 
a smooth abdomen and bare vulva, softly rounded hips. She might have been holding something in her left, broken off hand, a drapery likely, based on the way her right knee buckled inward, but I couldn't say with certainty. I tried mentioning this possibility to Alec in Greek, but upon hearing me, he appeared shocked, then offended. I repeated myself, quieter, and with a questioning lilt. He shook his head. In English, I apologized. I told him my Greek was rusty. He waved his hand as if to say, it's nothing. On his left ring finger, he wore a thin silver band, which he then continued to twist throughout our time together. He offered me a pair of white cotton gloves, and I began inspecting her every bend and fold. Her S-curved posture suggested a self-consciousness, but slightly open lips and wide eyes proposed something else. Was her expression lascivious or agonized? Her face had remained in pristine shape, and when viewed from certain angles, even glists with traces of gold paint. This was highly unusual for a statue so ancient. Elsewhere, she was either poorly sculpted or else decayed. The knees, for example, the ears. When viewed holistically, these mismatched conditions gave her beauty a patina of unease. I'd never seen anything like her. I bent to the statue's level, my eye line meeting her head, where ropes of wavy hair twisted into a crown, curls like limpets around her temple. Meanwhile, Alec circled the perimeter of the room, the edges of his wrinkled khaki shorts skimming each hairy kneecap, his black socks pouring into white tennis shoes. In English, he asked if I had been to Greece before, and in Greek, I said I'd been to Athens. Athens, he said, twisting his ring. Alone? I glanced out a small window on the other side of the room, where I could see nothing but a stone wall covered in pink blooming cacti. Yes, I lied. Yeah, alone. As I stood and strolled around her, the statue's pupilless eyes followed me. She had a lovely and delicate nose with a straight and prominent bridge and high cheekbones made more impressive by how they scattered light. My cousin, Alex said, your, he searched for the word, translator, here soon. Yes, great, I said, thanking him. And though I certainly did need a translator, I resented the stranger's disbelief in my abilities. My scrutiny fell again to the statue's neck, the knobs of her round shoulders, where both of her arms had snapped off at identical points. It wasn't uncommon for statues to be found without limbs, noses, genitalia, but usually the breaks were uneven. Hers appeared somehow purposeful, which isn't to say the fissures seemed inauthentic, just distinct. Every feature pointed to a different decade or area or origin. Was she made for the private or public? Was she modeled from a person or a goddess or both? I looked down at her feet, which were strangely large and devoid of detail, like they'd been hewn in a hurry. A few moments later, someone walked through the door and a gust of cold air hit me in the back of the neck. I turned. The translator came to me piece by piece, bouncy dark hair, a long lensed camera in his right hand, swim trunks, a white poplin shirt opened slightly to expose a rose tinged tan. He was a couple years younger than me, I guessed, early thirties. I had come straight to the museum from the airport in conservative funereal clothing. My luggage, an ugly shade of fuchsia, the kind of monstrous bag someone usually reserves for backpacking, leaned up against the wall in the corner. I hadn't brushed my teeth or reapplied deodorant in over 16 hours, and when I shook his hand, I offered a closed-lipped smile, trying to maintain eye contact as a way to show a dominance unfelt. He introduced himself as Nico Yorgos and began taking photographs of the statue. I thought you were the translator. He picked the camera up and said, budget cuts. As Nico walked around the room, he relayed facts about himself. He grew up in Athens, he told me, but disliked the pace and tried to gather information about me. He asked where in California I was from, and I said Northern, and then he said Los Angeles, and I said, I'm not from there, from there, I've just been living there. He asked how I was liking the island, good, though I had just arrived. After some time, he returned to my upbringing and said, 
You know, my wife, she is from Los Angeles. Is that not a miniature world? He got closer to the statue's nose, pressed the shutter. Even though I knew next to nothing about this man, his having a wife seemed odd. It's a big city, I said. I refocused on the statue and noticed something else about the positioning of her body. Her chest and shoulders were slightly turned inward, which made me consider the possibility she had come in a pair. What do you think of her? I asked Nico. Well, doctor, he said, as though reading my mind. I think she looks lonely. Grandfather now of ash and the immortal horse. The quaking aspens shudder, cleaned by the season's turning. Augers and diesel fellers finish the work, grading the hills down to the bone. North of balsam, where the Mississippi begins, my grandfather and I once walked, picking blueberries all through the summer under the long and widening calls of the loons. He watches himself stare out over that vanishing land, a good half stride from his body now, here in this memory. Thin and wordless as autumn, we play dominoes outside the nursing home where the hummingbirds hover at their feeders thick with sugar water. Their wings so fast they appear missing in the urgency of sweetness. He points beyond them, a pileated woodpecker that is not there, hammering against a yellow birch, and mouths the beginnings of words he can no longer find, whispers instead the names of soldiers buried beneath Sicily's orchards, or spread across the continent, Ash seed sown into an unending taxonomy of pain, erased by pain, over the hedgerows dividing Normandy for 2,000 years, forever, at least until forever one day ends. And the past ticks in the air as it works against the trunk of the body to take from him now what it did not take from him then. At night, he turns in his sleep like a shovel. Every night sky, a body made of eyes. Dark sea glittering with the dead, watching him survive. Bullets alight and open his body. Little burning keys turning once inside. Promise me, you'll never go to war. I did. I promised. Though in one way or another it is how any of us arrived here, through which the dead reach and touch our hands for a moment, yours and mine, before being carried away by the turning just out over the hills now of war. Every field a killing field. Every hourglass is filled with famine. A human skull is hardly seven inches front to back, yet the whole world fits inside. In the distant prairies of the brain, a gray horse thunders from every burning city, its hooves broomed and clicking, as if pecking away at the seconds passing beneath it. The earth, a long conveyor belt, abattoir of names, a great hand turning at the crank, a wristwatch lifted from a dead Italian soldier who perhaps believed or did not believe and what he had to do, but did it and wished, I'm sure, for more time. As the seconds went steadily on without him, rain against stone, laughter between the howls, between the final and the truly final, the last domino placed on the table, my grandfather singing here and not here, my grandfather, 25, and running through an orchard gathering figs in his helmet. A boy grinning like a boy. 
as German shells whistle overhead, hooves hammering the hills down to the bone. A fig branch beside him turns to flame. He runs for his life through the orchard and past corpses darkened by sun, past fruit so ripe the shock waves shake it loose, and then he stops once more to live. Perhaps not any longer, but just a bit more. To pick a few more figs. To check the dead man's watch on his wrist. Yes, just a few more seconds. Slow and thick. This fig juice rolling down his chin. Yolster. It is because of the glacier's long retreat, the water of the lake is lit green. When you were born, it touched the valley, and the cows could graze their way to its edge and lick the frozen hem of the mountain like an ancient salt block. The water is so clean you can walk to the stone shore and carry a pail full back to the cottage to boil for coffee. In the early hours of summer, when not even the fishermen have skimmed the dark to check their nets, when not even the cows have risen and the brome has not yet been shorn for the baler's spindling, you slip naked into the wild green water, so cold the heart seizes for a moment. You know of a man who, as a boy, leapt into water this cold on a hot summer day. His heart stopped shocked by the revelation. He was dead for minutes before being jolted back to the world. He was a boy still and would stay a boy forever. You think of him and how he did not speak again, but looked out onto the world with eyes the green of this water, retreating further and further each year into the skull until hardly peering out. From behind each orbital's ridge, you float out now until your feet cannot feel the stones beneath you and your arms grow heavy with cold. It would be easy to let the gentle tide take you, preserve you here in your youth, a long gone thing remaining in Baltic amber. It is the cold that alerts the body to its place in the world and the world's slow ascent out onto the ridge line, and then the anonymous horizon beyond it. Malachite, the color of the past undone. Azurite, the color of the thin morning sky when looked upon through cold green water. As you lay weightless beneath its surface, it is the color of your lips when you pull yourself back onto the rocks, awakened and made pure by cold by the nearness of your own body, the water still once more, and looking up into the opening sky, an eye into an eye, a single fisherman troubles the surface, shaking the first of his nets, as if trying to wake the lake, stir the lost world left there in the skim of its iris.